I always think you can describe science as involving a two-front war in theory. It should be a two-front war against excessive dogmatism and excessive skepticism. <laughs> so excessive dogmatism in the 17th, 18th century context is like the Catholic Church or it's this sort of decayed Aristotelianism and you know a scientist you know needs to think for themselves and challenge the the the, um, the sort of ossified uh, dogmas or ossified metaphysics and you just do an experiment you think for yourself um, but then you also can't be a scientist if you're too skeptical mm -hmm. so if, if I don't think you exist and I think you're just a <laughs> right, simulation right, right. or yeah. it's everything's fake nothing's real um, I'm just in a brain being you know, I'm just a brain in a vat being that's manipulated why I got by mad bored scientists. Of interviewing atheists. That, that's, that's not <laughs> yeah. a good. That's not a good world for science either. Yeah. So you can't be too too dogmatic. You can't be too skeptical. Yeah. Um, and sort of a probably healthy version of science cuts against both excess dogmatism and excess skepticism. But um, my scoring is it's all anti skepticism at this point. Uh, the scientific establishment it's all circling the wagons. And yeah. We have a climate change skeptic. We have a you know, you can't be skeptic of, you know, you can't be a vaccine skeptic, you can't be a skeptic of, of anything. And so it's all against skepticism, which is, of course, the exact opposite of, you know, let's say a children's science book would be that a sci right. scientist thinks for themselves and is, is against dogmatism. <laughs>the frustrations that people have with these things, you know, the sort of lack of trust in these things, you know, is the government wor working to silence you on Twitter or how is Google mm -hmm. manipulating the search results or all of these things? Do you also see those as inevitable problem problems that were going to happen as these thing, uh, with these things? The reason I ask is I heard you give a talk at mm -hmm. NatCon, you gave the keynote speech last year, and one of the things you said was that nobody represents the individual at these big conferences. Mm -hmm. And I sort of think mm -hmm. that's the same problem that we have with tech. Nobody represents the individual anymore. We just have these giant corporations that, or these giant tech yes. companies that make decisions. You cannot get somebody on the phone. You can't. You can't actually communicate as yourself. You there is you know there's a business version of it, something like that. Yeah, there probably are all kinds of ways they they have biases in that direction. You know, there's a. Uh, there's always uh, Noam Chomsky, the communist MIT professor, yeah. and I always like to quote him on this, where he, he says that you know the Republicans are the parties, the party of business, and the, but the Democrats discriminate. The Democrats are the party of big business, yeah. and um, <laughs> and and there's sort of like a center left. Look at you quoting a communist. There well, you yeah, go. It's, Every it's now not and again. entirely wrong about yeah. things, or you know, yeah. but um, but there's sort of a, a center left sensibility where, um, you know, uh, basically. Big businesses can be regulated. They'll follow all the rules. Small businesses, you know, um, they often make a little bit more money by uh, being in a gray area, not following the rules to the letter. And um, and so there is probably just this structural anti-small business bias that's that's uh, you know political, regulatory, cultural, partisan. That's very yeah. deep. Were you shocked how obvious that became during COVID? I mean, where, you know, Target could stay open for, you know, the big box store, but the mom and pop that was selling the exact same thing next door got closed. That, that shows the bias right there, right? The system just kind of eliminated a certain set of people. Uh, yes, I think, I mean, I, I, th I think it was, um, yeah, it was, a, I mean, a dramatic shift in terms of the, the power of big relative to small businesses. And uh, it probably... I don't know. I, I, th I think in some ways, COVID surfaced all these realities that had been there for a long time, yeah. and yeah, this was this is the institutional center-left establishment in this country. You know, it's, it's it's good with big business. It's it's anti. It's very anti-small business. How, how did you fight some of that with your businesses during COVID and figuring out, you know, were people going to work from home or, or just all of the nonsense that everybody dealt with? Did did you try to give as much power to your employees and say, do what you got to do, or? Well, you know, m m most of the because even now, a lot of the people still don't want to come back. That's one of the problems that that Elon's yeah, most having. most of the tech companies were were pretty um, well positioned to adapt to to COVID. Where you know, if you're if you're there were sort of ways you could do the remote work. Um, you could work remotely, do things like that, uh, and it seemingly didn't hurt the business too much. And then, of course, there was there was a way where COVID shifted a lot to the internet. So sort of a lot of the, the tech companies in which I'm involved, you know, got a, got a big temporary boost from COVID, even though, you know, maybe they, maybe they actually got, you know, more bloated, less well-managed 
in the last two, three years, and that's, that's what I worry about. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was actually sort of a windfall for them, and then the question is just, did they, did they really take advantage of it, or, or did, it, did they get um, even more dysfunctional in various ways? Do you think more people in the tech world, or maybe even in the political world, actually think like you to some degree, but because of the way we, the hive mind is, or the globalist movement, or whatever it is, they just sort of always go to that. But I think, you know, if you privately sat down with these people about what their real beliefs in the individual are in capitalism and these things. Uh, directionally, yes, but I, I think it, I always wonder if it actually works if you can't say it. So, uh, so yes, the, surely, it's the, almost the definition of political correctness, that it distorts things, and yeah. that there are all sorts of people who are, people are less politically correct than they appear to be, because political correctness is about appearances, mm -hmm. and then the reality is always that people are gonna think it's a little bit crazy, you know, there probably are a lot of parents who think the schools went very crazy. But, um, but then if you feel like you can't talk about it or articulate it, it's, it's not going to be that well-formed a view at all. And so, that's, and so I, I, I think the political correctness is, is real to the extent it just stops people from, from saying things. You, you, you don't actually get to a very considered non-politically correct opinion. Right, it's interesting because that also then gets to the stagnation part that you're talking about. If people can't talk about what the actual issues are, you, then you, you really don't have to wonder why we're so stagnated and why we got 140 yes. characters instead of flying cars. Sure, there's, there's probably some way all these things, yeah, all these things are, are linked, but, uh, but um, yeah, I, th I, th I, th I, think, I think if we live in a society where there are an awful lot of topics that are somewhat off limits, you know, where, you know, and if we think about science, I, let's, let's, let's think about sort of um, freedom of speech or debate in, in, in the area of science. And I, I always think you can describe science as involving a two-front war in theory. It should be a two-front war against excessive dogmatism and excessive skepticism. <laughs> so excessive dogmatism in the 17th, 18th century context, it's like the Catholic Church or it's this sort of decayed Aristotelianism and, you know, a scientist you know, needs to think for themselves and challenge the, 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 um, the sort of ossified uh, dogmas or ossified metaphysics and you just do an experiment, you think for yourself. Um, but then you also can't be a scientist if you're too skeptical. Mm -hmm. So if, if I don't think you exist, and yeah. I think you're just a <laughs> right, simulation right, right. or yeah. it's everything's fake, nothing's real, um, I'm just in a brain being you know, I'm just a brain in a vat being that's manipulated why I got by mad bored scientists. Of interviewing atheists. That, that's, that's not uh, yeah. a good. That's not a good world for science either. Yeah. So you can't be too too dogmatic. You can't be too skeptical. Yeah. Um, and sort of a probably healthy version of science cuts against both excess dogmatism and excess skepticism. But um, my scoring is it's all anti skepticism at this point. Uh, the scientific establishment it's all circling the wagons. And yeah. We have a climate change skeptic. We have a you know you can't be skeptic of you know, you can't be a vaccine skeptic, you can't be a skeptic of, of anything. And so it's all against skepticism, which is of course the exact opposite of, you know, let's say a children's science book would be that a sci oh, right. scientist thinks for themselves and is, is against dogmatism, so, not against skepticism. So what skepticism. do we do? What do we do to break it's out of that? It's 80% anti-dogmatism, 20% anti-skepticism. That's healthy science. We're in a world where it's 100% anti-skepticism. And that's a tell that it's that hyper dogmatic and that the scientists, you know, the scientists can't, Talk freely about the science, and if you have, you know, if you have, if you have dissenting views, you better keep them to yourself, or your government funding will get cut off, and they're, you know, they're all in the sort of government welfare or something like that. If you're looking for a more unfiltered lens into the world of tomorrow, check out our tech playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a wide variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.